Okay, I can barely contain my excitement to get this one out uh, there for everyone to absorb. There is so much, instead of this portion being three videos as we had discussed, uh, starting with the last one, part 10, which many of you have already watched. If you haven't, go back and watch that. It's a good start, starting point. The foundation is there. We are now making part 11 and 12 of Answers in Second Esther's uh, Daniel's 23 Days. So instead of one video there, we're going to do two. And then we'll go over to Answers in Jubilees and we'll complete. Uh, that is part uh, 33 over there. For a total of four videos on the timing of the end. But this is so important. And we're going to also find, and this is really cool, and see how this ties into this whole series, we're going to find the origin, the very origin, of the final head. It hasn't risen to full power at that point, no, but the origin, you'll see. Now, many will find great revelation in this. So many years have I personally, and I think all the guys here, uh, read this chapter, and it never struck me until some of the guys here at the God Culture started working on reconciling the biblical calendar. A massive task. We tried to go back in history, and man, I, I know my head was spinning. There seemed to be two. So we tried to correct the Jewish calendar, using that as kind of the basis, and maybe it just got off somewhere. But there's no hope for that thing. Better to just throw it out and start over, and that's what we eventually ended up doing. And uh, basically then, the Holy Spirit really began to reveal this in Daniel like we had never seen before. We'll see what you think. That's what we think. After the four beasts of Daniel 7, Daniel has another vision of two of the empires I repeat, only two of the empires are in this vision, and you'll see. This time, though, he sees them differently. Different animals even, but thats it's a different vision. That's not a big deal. However, these only serve as timestamps here in this narrative and for good reason. Bear in mind, too, by the way, the angel interprets this for us, and that's Gabriel. We can all pretty well trust his interpretation, right? So let's go with his interpretation rather than what we're hearing in prophecy classes, which go against what Gabriel says this means. Frankly, now that our eyes are open on this, there is simply no going back to any other interpretation. See if you feel the same way by the end. This will likely be a long one. Um, that's why we split it into two. So, uh, But bear in mind, guys, we're not here to entertain. And, you know, some would say, oh, I, I wish you had more pictures and more video or, you know, more music here or there. Look, we do that stuff. We do it in introductions and, and uh, endings. We don't really do it in our teachings because we're ripping through Scripture here. We're trying to prove all things, just as um, Paul told us to do. Bear with this and watch to the end. And I assure you. It will be worth it to truly understand this and know why. Want to split hairs over this detail or that detail or say, oh, no, I think your calendar's off by one year. We don't really care. We're going for a ballpark here. So th that's not even the purpose. But Daniel is about to tell us when the world ends. Did I just say that? Yeah, I did. Because he did. He will define the last days now, and you will understand this, most of you, for the first time. Even those in the Seventh-day Adventists who have it completely wrong, but not totally. It's actually somewhat right, but they got the wrong date. They're not even reading and bothering to see the time frame that this well defines and Gabriel tells us, even in an interpretation. Grab a hold of this because, as we discussed last video, Messiah says, We are the housekeepers watching for the thief whom we know is coming. We just don't know when. No man will know the day or the hour. He is clear on that. 
But we will know the season, and Daniel certainly knew the season, and this is his prophecy, not ours. So get ready to know, and you will. Daniel's Vision of the Ram and the Goat, 8 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Susan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. Now, Elam, that's Iran, not Iraq. He's not in Babylon anymore. A lot of people forget that. A lot of scholars don't even know that Daniel uh, spent his last years in Persia. I, I don't understand how they don't know that. But yet, they even try to force the Tigris into the passage. Well, Daniel never lived on or near the Tigris River. Uh, that's later, but still, same thing. The Hittichel that he invokes is never the Tigris River in Scripture, and we cover that in our Rivers from Eden series. It's another horrible translation from illiterate scholars trying to inject what they think it should say erroneously. And they just changed a river from Eden into a river that didn't even exist before the flood. Real smart. Daniel is on the Iran side of the Persian Gulf, nowhere near the Tigris. He has no visions on the Tigris and never mentions it even once. Let's be clear on that. Let's continue. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. Now Gabriel's going to tell us who this ram is and who the horns are. Don't worry. So this will be perfectly identified. There's no questioning who Daniel's seen here. The exact expansion of this empire. Verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. One. Notice. The empire from the west exactly, you'll see. Notice he already has one horn, and it is notable or large. This is the first king of this empire. Really not hard to determine whom this is. Verse 6. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. So he conquers the Ram Empire before him. This is a basically transfer of power within the very same empires. It's no different than what Daniel was describing before, but this gets to a different event that many seem to miss. Setting up the interpretation of Daniel's 2300 days from that event. And you'll see what we're talking about. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So that's the original ruler. When he dies, what happens? And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Very interesting because this is exact language, exact prophecy with 
the most accurate perfection imaginable. And you'll see. Now, the little horn. This is cool. Daniel 8, 9. And out of one of them, one of the horns, one of the four horns that had split, that come up basically from the one. Okay, so you have the one power, one emperor, one king, who splits his kingdom into four, and now you have a little horn which comes out of that kingdom. That's not Rome. Just saying. Okay, so came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. We just got exact directions. Exact. And we'll cover this. So we know exactly where this little horn rises from. We know on land, geographically, exactly. And history nails this. So this is a little horn, not a power, leading the empire. No, but within. Much smaller in authority at this time. Oh, this horn will wax very great and very strong to the very end times because what you're seeing, folks, is the origin of the final head of the eagle in power right here. Not world power. He rises in the end. But this is his very beginning. We're going to show you and we're going to nail this down to such a point that you're going to see this. And you can't unsee it once you see it. So the pleasant land is Israel. There's no doubting that. It's specifically Jerusalem where the temple stands. That is the pleasant land in Scripture. This is not Rome. And this little horn rises out of that area, by the way. It can't rise out of any other area. This is not a new empire. can't be. It's rising out of a horn, which is one of the four of this empire. See, it's got to make sense here. This is a power within this, you will see, Greek empire. Now, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. That is end times language there. And this is already identifying for us that this is going to be the final empire and the beast construct. It's right there in Daniel. Wow. Now, this is going to make more sense in the next video where we're really going to cover this in full and nail it down. You're not going to be able to really debate this, anyone who wishes to. So a little foreshadowing here. Pay attention because you are seeing the very final head of the Eagle Empire in its infancy, in its original power of a smaller kind, hasn't risen yet, and this isn't really a rising. This is a rising to power, but it's not the rising to the power as the final legal head. Oh, this, this, this power will take years and years to foster and grow and become the evil that it becomes by the time of the end, and it's rising right now. It will attack Israel and the temple. That's what this says. It's right there. I mean, it's right there. And wait till you see, because it gives more detail and even tells you it takes over the practice of the temple. Who is that? It's not Rome. It's not Greece, although it's part of Greece. Still part of Greece, though, here. We didn't enter into Rome's territory here. We are still in Greece's reign. Yes, the temple was destroyed by Rome. That is true. But it was already defiled. It was already taken over long before then. And we'll show you the date. We'll show you when. And this is going to help us make the calculation here and be accurate with it. This happened before Rome entered Israel in the vacuum left by Greece being conquered. This will make perfect sense. Hang with us. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Hmm. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. Now, folks, we don't have a daily sacrifice today. You, you do realize that, right? I mean, even if they build the third temple, that will still not be the daily sacrifice. Remember, Messiah already replaced animal sacrifice, but the daily sacrifice is also frankincense, myrrh, it's spices too. Don't forget that. And it occurred where? Well, in the temple. But see, the third temple is not his. 
and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Hmm. Do these powers conquer and defile the temple, taking away the daily sacrifice from the priests, you know, the ones who are supposed to be carrying it out? That's the point here. No, that's not Greece. Now, we'll show you that it's not Greece in history, and it is certainly not Rome either. This is not transferring to Rome. This is a power within Greece. That's what it says. And we'll show you which horn it rises from either, even because it says so, really. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. So what is he doing? He's transgressing. He's taking over the sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. He's taking it. And it cast down the truth to the ground. And it practiced and prospered. Wait a minute. Who was practicing the daily sacrifice in the days of Messiah? Well, wait a minute. They weren't sons of Zadok, were they? No, they exiled and they usurped the priesthood. We're going to go there. This power is a religious military power. It's both. It doesn't just conquer the temple and Judea. It takes over the practice of the temple. That's what this says. Read it. And it prospered or succeeded, and they certainly did in that day for a time. And even today again. It sure did, and they are in power even in the days of Messiah. But this is specific to the temple. And notice this. Let's call him wicked priest, would you say? Because he, or they, usurp the priesthood. That's what this is saying. Taking over the daily sacrifice. Look at the verbiage. He was against the sacrifice. How? By reason of transgression. He's trespassing. He's taking it over as his own. The transgression of desolation, you'll see, and we'll get to it. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake. Now, this is still within his vision here. This is a vision. So this is from Yahuwah. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Wow, what language. From the time that the daily sacrifice in the temple is stolen away from the temple priest, the legitimate priest, in which is called the transgression of desolation. This power of priestly usurpation has trodden the sanctuary. This is exact language from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We'll show you. And who are the hosts of the sanctuary? Those are the sons of Zadok at that time, before. Since the days of Solomon when the temple was built. And, of course, rebuilt. But it's the sons of Zadok. They were the ones given the priesthood. And even Ezekiel says they remained holy. 14. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall, shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, when does that happen? Two thousand three hundred days. So from this date, I'm given a date here. You say, oh, don't be date setters. Daniel's the date setter, folks. And again, this is a ballpark, though. We're, we're not looking for the day or the hour because we ain't going to find it. So don't look for it. You're not going to know that. So from this date when the temple was defiled, that's the key here. That's the event that we have to count from. There will be 2,300 days. Is it from the decree of Cyrus? Well, we already passed Cyrus. 
I'll show you. That, that's erroneous, and I don't know where in the world that comes from, for this counting. We're not talking about the 70 weeks. That's different. Now, we mentioned Ezekiel last video, who defines in prophecy days can be interpreted as years. And we believe this is the case definitively in this example. We'll explain this. What happens after 2,300 days or years, really? Well, the sanctuary will be cleansed. How does that happen? It happens on the day of final judgment and not before. There is no cleansing of the temple by fake priests. doesn't work. Building a third temple would not either. It doesn't undo what's already done, the defiling that has been done, especially not since the same power will be behind building the third temple, who is the final eagle head. Here is Gabriel's interpretation of the vision. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. See, angels can take the appearance of a man in Scripture many times over. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, the river, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So now Gabriel enters the picture. And we'll all be able to understand because Gabriel is going to explain what the ram, what the goat is, what it represents. He's going to pin this down time-wise. We're looking backwards at this event. Therefore, we can see it and know the exact date. And then we can count from there. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid, as we all would be. And fell upon my face, but he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. He's setting the time here. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. So Gabriel says this vision carries to the time of the end. Does he mean the end times, the latter days, that, that end? Is that what he's talking about here? Well, let's see, because he'll tell us. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Gabriel just said this vision goes to the very last end end. The day of final judgment. That's what he's talking about. And again, you'll see that's definitely the case throughout. It is that end, the appointed end. And now he clarifies the ram's identity. The ram, which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. We don't have to guess on this. But wait, I thought Daniel said Medo-Persia was the bear, right? Yeah, he did. This is a different vision, and for good reason. However, this dates this event to come after Babylon. So, okay, Medo-Persia, but who's next, and how does this progress? He's setting dates here, is what he's doing for this event. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha, Greece. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. Did everyone read that? Same as Daniel saw, the horn is the first king of Greece. That's Alexander. Now, that being broken, whereas four stood up for it. So Alexander died and then four kings. His nation is split into four. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation, the nation, but not in his power. Well, of course not, because you've taken a power of one and divided it by four. 
None will be as great as him again, and that's true. But talk about perfection in prophecy, because this happened after Daniel. So, wow. Let's go to this history. Alexander died in 323 B.C. Now, this is from World History Encyclopedia, but this is well uh, noted in history throughout, and you can find this in many, 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 many sources. So, there's no doubting that. It was that year that his kingdom was split into, well, exactly as Daniel said, into four. Amazing. So, Alexander the first. Horn, the first king of Greece, very well identified here, is replaced by four generals or kings of rule, really. Neither had his full power, just as Daniel saw, and Daniel was alive from Medo Persia and even served in Susan, Persia. However, he was not alive for this. Wow. So here you see the four territories, the four generals well defined. There's one of special note here, because the little horn rises from one of these four. Which one? Well, from the northern part of the same territory, he attacks Israel, or Judea at the time, the southern kingdom that was left, specifically Jerusalem, the pleasant land. Well, where does that fall? Look at the list. Here you go, Ptolemy I. He ruled Egypt, but also Palestine, Sicilia, Petra, Cyprus. So all of that area around Israel. Palestine goes all the way up to the northern kingdom as well. Again, these are totally redefined uh, by this point in history, and the northern tribes are gone. They were taken into Assyria and never returned. Watch our Lost Tribe series for all of that. We follow them through history and actually find them today, uh, at least generally. Now, this could not be more perfect. I mean, just, just this alone, you look at this and you say, wow, this Daniel was the real thing. Well, he was. They even try to say, well, you know, Belshazzar wasn't actually uh, you know, a, a king uh, of Persia. It, it just never happened. And guess what? All of those illiterate scholars and scoffers, really, went around saying that for, for centuries. And then they found a stele. Uh, that essentially recorded that Belshazzar's father uh, was king, but he left for a period, and during that time, Belshazzar was reigning in his stead. So it's right there. Daniel had it perfectly accurate, even more than scholars even knew. But see, that's the point. They don't know so much, especially if they don't use the Bible as their foundation. But worse is those that do claim they do and can't even read. And this is going to show that once again. So we're going to stop here in this video and recap quick and then uh, go to the next, which is uploading already, already done as well. The ram is Medo-Persia. That's what Gabriel said. Who do you believe? <laughs> Let's hope you believe the angel, right? Now, we know they ruled from 539 to 331 B.C. according to very abundant, very direct, very accurate history when it was conquered by, in 331, Greece. All right, we're going to see that. However, the event, the transgression of desolation, did not occur during this period. It just didn't. Now, how anyone can try to go back to, especially five. 47 or whatever it is, B.C. and place what Daniel's talking about here, there, they just stopped in the beginning of the story. They didn't even get to the middle of the story, whether alone to the end of it, and they're not even trying to understand this passage. I'm sorry, but that's fact, and Miller was wrong in that. He actually had the right idea in the days being years. He was right about that, but he started from the wrong start point. Now, this happens at the end of Greece's reign, and you're going to see this very, very clearly. Um, there's really not going to be any disputing this by the time we're done. 
Enter the goat, different animal, same empire in 331 B.C. Greece, right? Now, I know that's not what Daniel said he was in the previous chapter. He calls Greece, uh, you know, a different animal. Yes, he does, he does, he does, but that doesn't matter. It's not the point. This is a different vision. He's seeing this completely differently. And these are the only two empires in this story. They're it as far as empires are concerned. We're done here because it ends at Greece's end. And something happens that comes out of Greece, not Rome. Alexander is the first notable horn. And this happened in 331 B.C. Alexander's power, when he died, was then split into four, exactly as Daniel prophesied, and that would be about 323 B.C. The Greek Empire continued till 168 B.C., and the event that we're going to be covering next, as we finish the passage, very clearly happens around that time not 547, which is horribly off. Now, not to mention the counting doesn't even make sense. But anyway, until it was conquered by Rome, okay, in 168 BC. Now, that's Greece, was conquered by Rome in Greece first, right? Not in Israel. So, it takes time for that to flow down into the empire. But it was near, very, very near that time, and we'll get to an exact date for a start point at least. It was vulnerable once Greece fell, uh, and Rome did not enter Israel yet, or Judea at that point. So, Judea was a sitting duck, as they would say. Uh, to inject another animal into the story here. In this vacuum is when we see this small horn rise, who is a smaller power within the Greek Empire, specifically within one of these horns, one of these territories. That's where it must rise from. It can't be Rome. But really, this and its description is very, very I mean, I, you don't get better with the accuracy, how specific it is. A little horn then rises out of one of these four horns. Not anywhere else. It's got to be one of these four territories. Now, that's not Rome, can't be. That would be rather illiterate to say, as Rome would be an even bigger beast, not a little horn coming out of Greece, That's ridiculous. Daniel just called it a terrible beast, in fact, Rome, that is, in the previous chapter and vision, and we've spent all this time on the Eagle Empire, which is the Roman Empire mixed with the Myri clay. Now, you cannot apply that here. Rome did not rise out of one of the horns of Alexander's four generals. That's nonsense. This is a smaller power. And well identified, in fact, Daniel takes an arrow and puts it on the map for you. Yeah, we'll see that next. A power within one of these horns, an area within in the next video. We will prove this little horn rises from Ptolemy's reign, because that's what's being identified here, which covers the very land mentioned, Palestine. The pleasant land of Jerusalem, specifically, falls in Ptolemy. You will find they come from, then, the northern part of Ptolemy. That's what it says, because they went to the south and the east to defile the pleasant land or Israel. That pinpoints a very specific area, and an event we know in history is defined by Daniel Long before. This is amazing. So, the pleasant land is Jerusalem. There's no arguing that. This specifically identifies Samaria. You could call it Syria or whichever name. But as the power, and we are going to prove this out in history as well, Even from the history written by the Qumran temple priests, you know, the dudes that were there, 
eyewitnesses to the account itself being exiled from the temple by whom? They tell you. And we know when this happened. So all of this will be extremely clear in the next video. This is already incredible. Daniel really heard from Yahuwah. He saw things that vet so perfectly accurate. However, understand there are groups out there who kind of get this as 2300 years to the end, but then they ignore the passage which says so much more. But we will fully unveil this next. We are only about halfway into the chapter and the best part is yet to come. And then we will calculate the end generally to give us a ballpark and an era. But already before this power rises, whom Daniel exposes, we see, we know that the little horn rises out of Ptolemy's region. The northern part of it, which is south of Turkey, that's another general, and north of Judea, because it heads south and east into Jerusalem. Hmm. It just ain't that hard, folks. What is telling is this has been obscured by the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Yahoo demon or not, but do lie, Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. And they are the power behind the final head of the Eagle Empire. Next video already loading, so we'll end here. Yah bless to everyone. In 400 BC, the prophet Ezra predicted for my son Yahusha shall be revealed with those that be with him, and they that remain shall rejoice within four hundred years. Essentially, 0 BC, the era Messiah was born, and by his very name, in exactness. After these years shall my son Messiah die and all men that have life. The origin of John 3.16 And the time shall be when these things shall come to pass, and the signs shall happen which I showed you before. And then shall my son be declared, whom you saw as a man ascending. Even the end times are defined long before the book of Revelation. The son of Elohim being confessed in the world. After seven days, the world will be raised up. Mass resurrection of those who are asleep. The judgment seat. Evil will disappear. The Lion of Yehuda will consume the final empire, consuming his enemies with fire from his mouth. The lost tribes return. Every eye shall see him handing out crowns and giving palms. The road to salvation is a narrow gate. Few are saved. The Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life are opened in the end. He is not willing that any should perish. The signs of the end times and origin of Matthew 24 in part. These are just some of the many prophecies in the book of 2 Esdras, long before the book of Revelation was conceived. Second Ezra, written before John's revelation. This is the interpretation of the dream which you saw, and whereby you only are here lightened. For you have forsaken your own way, and applied your diligence unto my law, and sought it. That's Yahuwah speaking to the prophet Ezra. Second Ezra is dated at least 1st century B.C., as it is used to interpret Habakkuk and blessing of the prince of the congregation who is Messiah. This includes a radiocarbon dating testing uh, as well of one fragment from 120 to 5 B.C. We cover this in the introduction. 
This book includes 1st Esdras as well, which is also dated to the 1st century BC, when one examines what is called in fraud the Proto-Esther Fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which do not remotely fit Esther, but are a match to 1st Esdras. We cover this in the introduction of this book, as well as on our YouTube uh, videos on Esther in the original canon series. Second Esdras was quoted by Messiah according to the original authorized 1611 King James Version. Matthew 23, 37, and 38 is a direct quote from Second Esdras. Esdras, which is anchored right there in the margin note as the origin of Messiah's words. For Esdras is second Esdras, which we explain in the introduction. Yes, he quoted second Esdras multiple times. When accurately dated, 2nd Esdras proves the origin of significant doctrine in the New Testament. We cover many such instances in the introduction. There is a reason why these two books remain in some Bible canons to this day. They test as inspired scripture. Test them for yourself. Get your copy now, free in ebook. Again, this content is free. If you would like it in print, it is available on Amazon internationally and Shopee Philippines. Just go to toesdras.org. Download the ebook, and the links are there for your area. <music>